Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of this Close Readings podcast series from the London Review of Books on ancient Greek and Roman poets. I'm Thomas Jones, an editor at the LRB, and I'm joined as ever by Emily Wilson, Professor of Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Hello, Emily. Hi, Tom. And today we're looking at the life and work of Quintus Horatius Flaccus, otherwise known as Horace. He was a friend and more or less a contemporary of Virgil's, who we talked about last time. And like Virgil, he enjoyed the patronage or friendship of Mycenas, the immensely rich delicatee of Virgil's Georgics, as well as of the Emperor Augustus. Many of the Latin tags that are still part of almost everyday English, such as carpe diem, in medias res, dulciet decorum est, nil desperandum, nunc est bibendum, come not from the Michelin man, but from the poems of Horace. And we know more or appear to know more about Horace's life than we do for most of the other poets we're discussing this series, in part because he often writes or appears to write autobiographically. Though, of course, it's open to question just how reliable he is. And his self-presentation is full of contradictions. Like Walt Whitman, Horace contains multitudes. He was born in southern Italy, at the opposite end of the peninsula from Virgil in 65 BC. Can you tell us a bit about his early life, Emily, his origins? Yes. So Horace himself, as you say, tells us about his early life, especially in his early work, The Satires, which is one of his chattiest um, collections of poetry. He tells us that he was the son of a freedman. So his father was at some point in his life enslaved. As you say, he, he was born in the south of Italy, which would have been a region very much influenced by Greek culture through both trade and the demographics of the region. So from an early age, he was certainly aware of um, of Greece, of Greek literature and Greek poetry, Greek philosophy. His father, despite being an enslaved person, had had the money to give Horace an extremely expensive education. So he went from the, from the provincial south to Rome and studied there. And then later, later, as a young man, he went to Athens and studied philosophy. We know that he studied at the academy, which had been founded by Plato, but was during this Roman per- this this period, um, very much influenced by Epicureanism as well as Stoicism. So Epicureanism had an important influence on Horace's thinking, and the presentation of himself as a fat pig from the herd of Epicurus appears in his poetry as well. Um, he he there probably in Athens met um, Brutus, who was one of the assassins of Julius Caesar, and he fought at the Battle of Philippi on the Republican side, on the side of trying to restore the Republic from the threats of autocracy of the various people trying to seize control of one man control of Rome. But then once um, once Octavian, who was the future Augustus, won won the Battle of Philippi, Horace switched sides and was given amnesty by Octavian and then became pretty close to the, the circle of Octavian through Mycenas, this rich patron of, patron of the arts who was also close to Augustus. Um, Horace tells us in, again, one of his early satires that he went on what he describes as a fun buddy road trip with both Mycenas and Virgil and he presents it as here we went, let me, let me tell you all about the food, let me tell you about the hookups that I failed to have along the way. Um, but the journey that he's describing was actually a political journey um, to create a treaty between Antony and Octavian, which lasted throughout the 30s until the Battle of Actium. So so throughout his like, those early years of Horace being in his 20s, he was rising in, in the social circles of Rome and becoming closer and closer with Mycenas and Virgil and also then implicitly with Octavian and becoming one of the sort of court poets of the future Augustan regime. Um, and also Mycenas bought him a farm, didn't he? His famous... His... Mycenas bought him a farm, yes. So like many Romans, he seems to have lost the family farm thanks to... Um, there, was a, there was a whole sequence of land confiscations of people who had um, inherited estates um, who got their lands taken away because in the attempt to rehouse veterans from the various Roman civil wars. Um, Mycenas got Horace what he calls as a tiny little Sabine farm. Um, it was actually a huge estate and clearly a b- very big handout re- representing Mycenas's faith in Horace uh, as one of the poets who was going to define what Augustinism would be. So we have these some of these poems which seem to be sort of quite simple or, on this, or superficially simple hymns of praise to the countryside and to, and, and to Italy and to the simple ways of life and and but all the same time it's all part of quite a sophisticated 
presentation or representation of of Augustan Rome. I mean, there was a strong propaganda element to these. Huge propaganda element. I mean, uh, uh, most revolutions need to present themselves as a return to tradi- tradition. And that was certainly true of the Augustan Revolution, that in order to create this very different and alien political structure whereby Augustus was the one-man autocrat of Rome in a culture where the idea of having expelled the kings and being now a republic was crucial to a lot of elite Roman men's self-identity of themselves as free people. In order for Augustus and his cronies to present um, his new regime as just fine, he needed to present it as traditional and we're going back to the old values of the Roman countryside and Horace's poetry is speaking to that. It also is maybe in praise of simplicity, but the poetics is never simple. It's always very, very artful and drawing on multiple different Greek and also Roman earlier poetic sources. And should we listen to to a reading of one of them now? This is number 11 from the first book. So this is from the first book of the Odes. After the Battle of Actium, in which Octavian had defeated Antony and Cleopatra and, and consolidated his power during... The next decade, Horace was composing these very, very artful um, lyric poems in imitation of Greek meters, in a whole variety of Greek meters. So this is Ode 111. Don't you ask Lucanoe? The gods do not wish it to be known what end they have given to me or to you, and don't meddle with Babylonian horoscopes. How much better to accept whatever comes? whether Jupiter gives us other winters or whether this is our last now wearying out the Tyrrhenian Sea on the pumice stones opposing it. Be wise. Strain the wine and cut back long hope into a small space. Even as we speak, envious time flies past. Harvest the day and leave as little as possible for tomorrow. That harvest the day is is carpe diem, which is often translated as seas, but it is more harvest, isn't it? It's, pl- it's the verb it's used harvest, for plucking yes. fruit. And... It's used for, used for plucking fruit. I mean, there are, there are words in Latin such as rapio for seas in a more violent way. It suggests that the, the day is like this, the, the grain that goes along with the wine that we're supposed to, to strain so that we'll get some lumpy, sedimenty wine, but we need to drink it right now because there might not be a tomorrow. So the whole poem is, is very much focused on how Everything is transitory. The the sea is wearing away the rocks and the rocks are pumice stones and they're also opposing the sea. Everything suggests this passing of time. But then we're also focused on this particular very, very specific moment with a named addressee in a very specific location on the west coast of Italy. And like a lot of lyric poems and a lot of pop songs and Marvel's His Coy Mistress, it's saying to this, to this woman, Lucona, we, we haven't got long, so we'd better go to bed right now. Um, yes, and it's not saying it explicitly, but it's, of course, absolutely clear. I mean, it's, it's clear even in the fact that she has a Greek name. So presumably she's an enslaved Greek woman who's been hired for the night or been bought for the night. In contrast to Catullus, where his evocations of you should have sex with me right now suggest that his lesbian might have a choice about it. There is, it isn't so clear in this poem whether Lee Connery has much choice about it, but she's being given this um, Greek-influenced seduction slash whatever else you want to call it about how much of a creep the narrator is. Um, poem, a poem which is, which is inviting her to, to go to bed with him to, to have sex with the narrator as soon as possible because she could be dead soon. Thanks for listening to this extract from Among the Ancients a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.